So uh, thank you all for having me this evening to uh, share my experiences with uh, creating serverless solutions with Azure Functions. Uh, I've created a small solution which I'm using in production right now. Uh, and I've come across some well, things I'd like to share with you all. Uh, anyone familiar with serverless computing, Azure Functions? Yes, yes. AWS uh, Lambda. Also, cool. Uh, Google Functions? Good. Well, I'm not, uh, <laughs> I'm, I'm not very familiar with AWS uh, Lambda. I've used people using it, and it's quite awesome, or so I've heard. Uh, but I'm only working on the Microsoft stack, so I'm only focusing on the Azure Functions uh, side of things. So for the people who haven't heard about uh, serverless uh, yet, uh, I'll do a short introduction of uh, serverless. Uh, so the name is a bit, uh, well, uh, disrespecting to the, uh, to the servers, because there are still servers, of course, uh, in a serverless world, uh, because your software has to run somewhere. It's not some distributed desktop system. Uh, it, it, the thing is, you just don't have to care about servers anymore. This is something we also heard when uh, the Microsoft offered a, a PaaS solution. Uh, also, Amazon offers uh, PaaS solutions, and I guess Google also. Uh, so what's the difference? Well, the main difference is uh, the regular PaaS solutions aren't very fast in spinning up and spinning down. Uh, there are a couple of other differences, of course, but there's, uh, you could see serverless as an evolution of the platform as a service offerings today. Uh, Adrian Cockcroft has a nice quote about uh, serverless and PaaS. Uh, if your PaaS solution can spin up and spin down very quickly and is meant to run a couple of milliseconds, you can call your PaaS solution serverless. I don't agree fully with this, uh, with this quote, but it's a nice elevator pitch to get people to talk about uh, serverless. And I guess Adrian Cockcroft knows what he's talking about because he's like the Scott Guthrie of Amazon. So spinning up and down really fast and being able to run uh, small amounts of uh, compute uh, sounds a bit like containers, or at least some people think about containers when they hear this. Uh, that's not entirely true because containers are still running on servers. Also, of course, serverless stuff is running on servers, but containers are somewhere totally different on the on the well the technology stack, as you can see in this uh, this diagram. Uh, containers is more like well, if EAS on steroids. Uh, you're scripting your uh, network, you're scripting your systems. Uh, you do have a small container which is able to do a very bit, a small amount of compute if you want to. Uh, but containers can do a lot of other stuff also. Uh, serverless is uh, also referred to as FAS, functions as a service, uh, which is much higher in the stack and is meant to uh, run uh, when an action is when there's some kind of action going on or it's triggered by something. As you can see, PaaS is uh, somewhere in the middle. And of course, you have uh, SaaS solutions uh, like Office 365, which, well, runs in the cloud and you don't care about anything. Uh, but you can also, most of the time, not uh, run any code on it. Um, so Azure Function, the Azure Function team has uh, created a small container. Uh, I think it was in December, maybe in January, but I guess I think it was December, which has the Azure Function runtime on it, which you can also uh, download and install on your own uh, machines, which enables you to run Azure Functions on your own local on-premises uh, server and also in containers if you want to. Uh, but I don't see any reason why at least I would do this because I want to run everything in the cloud and the least amount of configuration, the better. Uh, so I'm only running stuff on the actual function platform and I would recommend you do it also unless there's some important reason you don't, of course. Sorry? For testing, uh, well, there are some advantages to uh, running your own 
local Azure function runtime, like uh, being able to uh, configure which assemblies are loaded on the system, uh, which version you are running, uh, if you are very eager to run stuff on premises. Uh, so there are some advantages, but if you're already running in the cloud, you could uh, you could just run uh, the the actual serverless offering. We have a, this is a microphone. I forgot to explain the service. Sorry for that. Uh, we will turn this one to you. We can ask a question and also be uh, the live team correctly. It's fun. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <coughs> There's also you can run uh, beta software uh, in your uh, actual containers if you want to, like. Uh, I think it was in January, uh, the .NET Core version 2.0 wasn't supported fully in the Azure Function runtime, uh, or at least the public Azure Function runtime yet. But if you use the container, you could just run it and run your functions locally or in the container. So as I said, there are some advantages, but for most production systems, if you want to go serverless or fast, uh, try to keep on the actual runtime. So as I said, lots of configuration and just your code. Uh, one, one thing you should remember when going serverless is uh, keep all your functions and all your uh, actual code uh, small and simple. Uh, there are a lot of advantages to keeping it small and simple. Of course, it's easy to understand your functions, but also uh, the deployment of your functions will be much faster. Uh, as you can imagine, if you have some function which is about 50 megs of stuff, uh, it takes quite some time to deploy this, compile it, uh, stuff like that, uh, which will uh, well add to the latency of the ramp up time of your Azure function. Uh, so there are, and it also uh, takes in effect the single responsibility principle of a function. Your function should do one thing and do it good. And if you, it needs to, and if you think it should do uh, two things or three things, uh, please make two or three functions which, well, do uh, do stuff uh, after after each other. So for the real life uh, solution I've created, uh, I've came up with it uh, about a year ago. <coughs> because uh, I was eager to do some uh, more uh, talking on meetups and sessions and uh, uh, write some more blogs. And uh, I wanted to use my own custom uh, minified URLs. Uh, so I've uh, signed up uh, at Bitly to create minified URLs. And if you want, you can also point a CNAME record to uh, Bitly in order to make your own, well, uh, 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 Lee. Uh, slash uh, URL. Uh, this worked uh, all. Uh, this worked uh, very fine, and I was uh, quite happy with it until they uh, notified me when I wanted to create a new uh, minified URL. I should upgrade to the premium uh, offering of Bitly. Well, I'm eager to pay for software at least if I like it, and also for software services. But when I uh, Navigated to the pricing page. Uh, it told me it costs about a thousand dollars per month <laughs> to use a minification uh, service, which is a bit much if you're doing a session once or twice a month, and also for a for a blog post. So I guess well, I I thought well, is it hard to write a URL minification service? Because what what's actually going on when accessing uh, and creating minified URLs? Well, you get a minified URL and redirect to the actual URL, but and you. The cost now? Sorry. What's the cost if you run it as a uh, serverless? As a serverless uh, solution, um, I've made an error when deploying my stuff, uh, so uh, I've chosen a couple of uh, technologies, and one of them is the Cosmos DB, and I've uh, chosen to add a partition to the Cosmos DB, which, uh, uh, which, uh, for which I needed to have a thousand DTUs for well doing stuff, which cost about 60 bucks per month. And of course, the Azure Functions, which cost, well, nothing. Uh, so it cost 60, months, uh, 60 euros per month from my MSDN subscription. 
uh, but because uh, that's only because I used uh, partition uh, key and once I removed this partition key, Cosmos DB only costs about 20 euros per month. Uh, and the Azure functions cost, well, nothing. Maybe m some micro cents. Yeah, yeah. And it, you can do it even cheaper. I'll come back uh, to it uh, later on. But it's actually quite cheap. One, the only thing you're paying for is the repository. <coughs> so, but this is uh, what you actually need for a URL minification service. Of course, Bitly offers a lot of other stuff like nice reporting and graphs and insights in who has clicked your uh, links, which is all fun and fun, of course, but I don't need all of that stuff. Googly, yeah, but I'm against Google. So I don't want I, I don't want I don't want to use uh, their offerings. Yeah. <laughs> no, I'm not against uh, Google. I just don't use the products or try not to use the products. Uh, but uh, as you can see, uh, we have one command, and we have one query uh, to do all I want, and this is about half of uh, the acronym called CQRS which is about commands, which is about queries, and segregating their responsibility. Uh, I don't know if you're all familiar with the CQRS pattern, but it's about, uh, well, splitting the reading and the writing functionality of your application uh, in, well, different functional areas. Uh, this is a short, well, uh, slide of it. As you can see, you have a user uh, this user is uh, trying to write something via the write endpoint, which is provided to him. It, uh, this write endpoint uh, stores some data in a repository. The write uh, the repository, this repository is uh, optimized for writing, uh, so it's uh, it should be super fast. And whenever there's something persisted in this uh, update or this write uh, repository, this change is also uh, added or, uh, well, this change is also persisted in the read data store, which is optimized for reading. So, completely denormalized or, yeah, completely denormalized data. And once you want to read this data, you just uh, head to the read endpoint and it should be very fast in reading this data. So, that's what CQRS is about in very short layman terms. But uh, as you can see, this is actually quite good for Azure Functions because we need two endpoints, uh, a, a, a command endpoint to write data in a data store. And we have an endpoint which retrieves data from the data store. And I think about all of the Azure Function solutions you will ever create fits in this pattern. There might be exceptions, of course, but it's a good go-to uh, reference uh, design pattern to go to. And as I mentioned, because I wanted to uh, create a complete serverless solution, I chose to use uh, Cosmos DB as my repository. Uh, it was quite expensive, at least for me on my MSDN account, because it only has about 130 euros per month. And spending about half of it on a Cosmos DB uh, sounds a bit excessive. Uh, but now I've uh, enabled it. Uh, well, now I've changed it to uh, only cost about 20 euros per month, which is better. Uh, I've read, uh, I'm not the only one with this uh, idea of creating a URL minification uh, service with Azure Functions. Uh, someone else has created this also, and uh, at least that's what I've read in a tweet last month. And he's uh, used uh, Blob Table Storage, uh, the Azure Blob Table Storage, which is very, very cheap, because when using the blob table storage, you only pay for uh, the data stored. And as you can imagine, storing some characters uh, of a link and characters of a minified link doesn't take up a lot of gigabytes. Uh, so I guess he only paid about 1.7 or 17 cents per month for his URL minification service. So mine is very expensive, but at least it's completely serverless. Yay for me. <laughs> no, but uh, you can make it as uh, cheap or expensive as uh, you want to. One advantage, and that's probably the, 
best technical advantage of uh, me choosing uh, Cosmos DB instead of the blob storage is the Cosmos DB change feed. Uh, it's uh, something which has been introduced, I guess, in October or September last year. And what it does, it enables you to act upon changes inside your Cosmos DB. So whenever someone inserts or changes a record in your Cosmos DB, be it Cassandra, Mongo, Document DB, Graph DB, I'm forgetting the other one. There are five implementations as of now. Uh, if I remember correctly. Well, whenever some change occurs in Cosmos DB, it will be reflected on the change feed, which you could see as one big queue, which has changes of, of the change records in a database. And you can act upon it. Uh, there's a lot of uh, cool stuff you can do with it. And one of them is creating an Azure function and uh, acting upon this. Uh, this isn't very useful in my scenario because Cosmos DB is really, really fast. I guess I think Microsoft says it has single digit response times uh, wherever in the world. So it's a maximum of nine milliseconds uh, to respond uh, if you do a query on it. Of course, it, it might actually, if you uh, request a big document, it might take up a lot of time to push it to your app, but at least Cosmos DB will respond uh, very quickly. Uh, this is uh, very useful uh, for updating the read repository, of course, because whenever you write something in Cosmos DB, you can update some other repository uh, with an Azure function uh, uh, to update the read, doc uh, read database. And the other stuff is interesting also. Uh, I haven't used uh, all of this stuff, but uh, I look forward uh, using it in the future, if I have time. <coughs> so a URL minification service, how would you uh, create this in a non-serverless world? Well, it's not very difficult. You just create a web application, connect it to your repository, and be done with it. Of course, this web application has uh, multiple endpoints, uh, the get and the, the update endpoint, or the create endpoint. So you probably create a uh, ASP.NET Core web API uh, around this, or maybe some nice visual UI to create a new, create and retrieve new records. So that's about it. Uh, you could make this as fancy as possible if you want to, but this is a minimal viable solution. So in the serverless world, as I mentioned, we will have two endpoints, or at least we still have two endpoints, but in the Azure function world, we need two different Azure functions, one to retrieve the data and one to create the data. Uh, in my solution, I've created HTTP-triggered Azure functions, which do something whenever someone hits my endpoint. And in my case, uh, the post, uh, I'm using Postman to invoke the, this endpoint. Uh, I'll just post some uh, JSON uh, to, this, to this, and it will uh, verify my, uh, my data and uh, persist it in Cosmos DB. And whenever someone hits the read endpoint, it will just read from the Cosmos DB. Of course, this is the minimum viable solution and isn't very fancy and there doesn't use all of the Azure function goodness, which is uh, available, uh, and also not the Cosmos DB change feed. And because I actually want to use the change feed, uh, I come up with uh, this diagram just to use a change feed and be more CQRS-like. So as you can see, I'm now using the change feed. I've uh, hooked up a uh, trigger to this change feed to update an Azure cache, which is just a Redis cache. Uh, and the get, uh, the get Azure function will only read from this Azure cache. There is some, uh, one problem with this, is uh, the Azure cache might die and be empty. And there's no way of... Uh, adding data to this cache yet, or at least not automatically. So I'd have to create a new uh, trigger to update the cache and do stuff with it. So that's one flaw in this design. But for uh, the rest of it, it's quite nice. Uh, I just wasn't happy with the, the stuff uh, below, the post directly pushing data to the Cosmos DB. So what I came up with later. Oh, I'm forgetting. 
uh, don't use uh, don't use uh, HTTP triggered GET functions uh, if you want to use an actual uh, production system uh, because uh, Azure Functions has two plans. Uh, one plan is actually serverless, which is the consumption plan, and the consumption plan uh, in the consumption plan you actually don't have to care about servers, which is awesome, of course. Uh, one problem with it is uh, it might take some time to spin up. I've seen response times of, well, 500 to 800 milliseconds before my endpoint uh, did something. And that's because Azure has to deploy my binaries to uh, a server, uh, which is somewhere within Azure. Uh, deploy it, compile it, uh, making sure the, the app is responsive, and then actually handling my request. So this takes quite a bit of time. I've seen other people having to wait for minutes because before their uh, request was handled, so that's not a very good idea. So if you have an, if you th you're thinking of an HTTP trigger get endpoint, uh, either use don't use Azure, Azure Functions and just use a web app, which could be always on and always responsive, or use the other offering of Azure Functions, which is the app service plan. Uh, which is, isn't serverless because you're deploying your Azure function in the app service plan, which, well, just is a VM. You just don't have to care about the VM that much. Uh, and you can uh, just check the, the mark uh, on, of uh, always on in the Azure portal. Uh, so it will always be responsive and will probably uh, respond within a couple of milliseconds. Uh, so that's another well, not really a flaw, but one, uh, one thing you have to think of when creating uh, a serverless, when creating a serverless solution. Are you making the case to not use serverless? You, um, you should use serverless, of course. Yeah. Uh, but when having an HTTP trigger with a, when doing a GET, or a POST also, of course, it could take a couple of seconds before uh, the the action is uh, well handled, and uh, if you're using the consumption plan, so if you're using the Azure App Service plan, it should react immediately. But that's not really serverless. That's more fast as a well. That's more fast. So you're deploying your functions on a VM. Uh, so in an actual actual production system, I would probably change uh, the GET and the POST endpoints to, uh, to a normal web application and having all of the backend stuff serverless uh, because, well, uh, in an actual production system for a customer, I probably want a bitly interface with graphs and stuff like that. So you probably want to create an Angular or few uh, front end or, s or the other. Uh, uh, so, in an actual production system, you probably don't want uh, these endpoints, uh, don't want to use these HTTP triggered endpoints, uh, but for my uh, solution, it will suffice because I don't care that much of 500 milliseconds delay. Yes? So, you're saying with serverless, you cannot create a UI? Uh, so, you're asking uh, if you can create a UI with uh, serverless uh, offerings? Um, that's something I uh, wondered about a couple of months ago also. Um, uh, and the answer is you can, but just because you can doesn't mean you should. Uh, because what an Azure function is, uh, it's just some code which is running. And if you want, you can just uh, pull back a lot of static files and uh, just uh, respond with HTML or JSON or, or whatever you want. But it's not meant to do this. Uh, there are some proof of concepts uh, you can find on, uh, on the internet with people just proving you can create a, a nice web application with Azure Functions. It's just not something the team wants you to do. Or yes. Yes, yes. If you're interested in uh, creating a nice uh, front end or a nice, uh, well, some something a user can use. Uh, just create an, an app service. 
uh, with a website in it or something else which can host a website and you, all of your static files. And having the API serverless is a great idea, uh, but if you actually need well, user interaction, uh, you, it's probably better to uh, use the tools uh, which are meant for it. Uh, the people which have created this proof of concept of a website using Azure Functions have used the, the CDNs which are available and responded with some HTML template file which had all of the CDN links in it and uh, the HTML which they outputted had the data they wanted to, uh, to uh, return to the user. So it's, it's quite dirty. Uh, it's possible, but it's quite dirty. So don't do, don't do it. Uh, yeah, like I mentioned, I didn't like uh, the line below, uh, having the HTTP post trigger uh, writing directly in the Cosmos DB because uh, it's actually doing two things now, validate, validating the input and writing data in the Cosmos DB. So what better way to make this uh, cloud native? Well, add a service bus because each awesome cloud architecture needs a service bus inside it, or at least a queue. Uh, so that's what I did, uh, having the post uh, HTTP trigger, doing some validation on the incoming uh, JSON, uh, adding some data to it, like the date time created, uh, stuff like that. Uh, posting the object to a queue, actually a topic, because I like topics much more as queues, but that's just me. Uh, having a new Azure function being triggered by data on this queue, and this uh, triggered Azure function will do the persisting of data in the Cosmos DB. So now all is asynchronous, uh, all is working as I want, and it's quite extendable because when using a topic, you can just create a lot of subscriptions uh, for different uh, Azure functions or other stuff uh, to, do, to extend your functionality. So if I want to log uh, whenever some minified URL is being created or requested to be created. I could just add a logging Azure function or you know, do other stuff uh, over here. Uh, so I'm happy with this uh, design. Uh, for now, I've chosen to skip the above part. Uh, main reason for it is Azure Functions uh, doesn't have native support for Redis cache yet, or at least it didn't have so a couple of weeks ago when I investigated this. Uh, and what I mean with native, uh, with native support is uh, you can't do bindings and you can't uh, have triggers uh, based on, uh, on Redis cache. There are a lot of triggers and bindings uh, in the Azure Function uh, runtime, uh, which means you can bind to stuff on queues, topics, service buses, event grids, Cosmos DB, uh, blob storage, well, there are a lot of other things uh, which are available and also tri uh, being triggered on a lot of stuff which is happening. Like I mentioned, the change feed, you will, your Azure function will be triggered whenever you register to this. Uh, but there's not something for Redis Cache yet, or at least not to my knowledge. Uh, there has been an announcement for you, to be, uh, for you to be able to create your own custom bindings and custom triggers. Uh, I've read about this a couple of months ago. And this sounds awesome, at least for me to create my own custom Redis cache binding and Redis cache trigger. Uh, but I haven't had time to do this, so that's why I haven't separated the retrieval of data yet. Uh, this also means, these bindings and triggers also mean you don't have to write your own persisting logic anymore. So, because who likes it to create their, well, create another new repository or who likes it to create a file reader or file writer. Well, I've done it a couple of times, and well, now I know how to do this, and I don't actually like doing this. So, uh, making use of bindings. Is it possible to use uh, Redis Cache Persistence in Azure? Uh, the question is, if it's possible to use Redis Cache uh, Persistence in, uh, in Azure? Uh, yes, uh, you can use uh, Redis Cache for, well, all of the offerings uh, in Azure, and also for Azure Functions, it's also quite possible. You just have to create your new Redis Cache client and add uh, stuff to... Storage. Sorry? For storage. So, so 
systems work from storage, stores it in a file, and then it starts up, reads from the file? Uh, I don't know. I guess it's possible. But uh, yeah, sure. I haven't uh, dug into it uh, much yet, but it should that should be possible. Yes, uh, yeah. So uh, when using Azure Functions, just use bindings and triggers. Uh, so the runtime will do the actual persisting and uh, polling for data for you. And how does this look like? Well, uh, whenever you look uh, into this on uh, on the Azure Docs, you'll see uh, some JSON looking like this. Uh, having a function JSON with some uh, bindings inside it and specifying uh, the type of trigger uh, you want in the case of a trigger and some properties which are necessary uh, for, in this case, an HTTP trigger. This is the function binding for my get minified URL. So as I said, it's a minified URL. It has a slug uh, which is prefixed with API. I'll come back to this uh, later on. Uh, it's a get method. You can specify any method you want over here, post, boot, delete, but a get uh, should only have the get method over here. Authentication level, quite important, uh, because I want all of the world to use my minify URL. I'm using anonymous, but uh, you could uh, add function user system or admin over here, and whenever you do this, you have to specify some bearer token in order to uh, access the function, and of course the name of the uh, of the variable uh, parameter which will be uh, injected inside your Azure function. So that's about it for an HTTP trigger uh, binding or HTTP trigger. Uh, there's also uh, one for uh, having a document DB uh, binding. Uh, as you can see, you're specifying uh, the type document DB the name which will be injected inside your Azure function, in this case it's minified URL, and you have to specify some additional uh, properties which are uh, unique to the document DB binding. Yeah, of course, because it's an output binding, uh, I want to write to document DB, I have to specify the direction which is out. Uh, if you forget to do this, uh, stuff won't get written inside your Cosmos DB. Ask me how I know. So that's about it. And I advise not to write any JSON. I'm not a firm believer in JSON. I hate it, actually. Uh, so don't do it, especially if you're using uh, if you're using Visual Studio, because Visual Studio will do the actual writing of these JSON files for you, mm -hmm. which is better because now you don't have to write curly braces all over and making sure the alignment is correct and, uh, yeah. So uh, don't write JSON. Make, uh, make sure you use Visual Studio and the Azure runtime tooling will do this for you. Now I was planning to start uh, coding uh, some functions uh, <coughs> now, but uh, there's still some stuff I have to cover because there's the matter of where will I put the code. Uh, whenever you look on online and uh, most of the time the Azure uh, Functions documentation, you will see people uh, writing code in CSX files, which are script files, which understands uh, C Sharp. Uh, and they have uh, lots of uh, stuff happening in these CSX files, which is awesome, of course. But is this a good uh, is this a good practice? I think not. Well, at least not if you ever want to create this for your customer or in, in an enterprise uh, way, because what you'll get is a lot of duplication of code. I'm not <coughs> against creating duplicate code because it has its usages. Uh, you can one of the advantages is you can make your code quite simple to read and uh, and and you know, quite simple to read and the changes are only uh, reflected on the changes you are actually making uh, but it's still I think if you have some code which is doing some logic it might be better to create a class which is handling the this logic probably uh, in a business layer or maybe in a business namespace if you want and what about your favorite libraries? Uh, 
I'm a, I'm a big fan of using AutoFuck and AutoMapper and well, LogFanet and stuff like that in my uh, solutions. Most of the time I just download these NuGet packages in my solution and then I'm uh, going to think of, well, what am I creating? Well, at least I'm having these packages. Do you have to use these uh, libraries inside your Azure functions? Uh, please, th please think about it because they, uh, they because whenever using these libraries, you're making, well, you're creating some dependencies on some other assemblies, which might be 500 kilobytes, five megabytes. Well, they add up, especially if you're using a couple. And as I mentioned, all of these libraries will add up in the total package of your Azure Function solution. And there's a difference in having a solution of 50 bytes or having 50 kilobytes. It will add up to the time uh, Azure Function runtime will be able to deploy, compile, and making sure your Azure Function is available. So be wary of using external libraries. Most of the stuff you want to do uh, can be done quite easy with your own code. And it, uh, and it will make your, and whenever it's your own code, it's probably simpler to read. Not always, of course. And then there's the matter of, should I test? Of course you should test, because, well, we're living in 2018, and everyone should test, and we should have 100% coverage. I don't fully agree with this. Uh, of course, I'm a big fan of uh, doing some tests, uh, but only if it matters. Uh, just make, uh, if you have a function which only has some input and stores it inside your Cosmos DB, well, the Azure function runtime will probably do most of, the, most of the actual running of your code, and you might have one or two lines of code inside your Azure function which does something, maybe validation. Uh, should you test it? Well, uh, uh, depends on how important it is. Uh, most of my Azure functions don't have any tests unless I'm doing something fancy in the business logic. Uh, so. I, as I mentioned, it might be a good idea if you have some logic to place it inside a new class. And whenever you're creating a new class or, th or think you need some uh, logic inside a new class, well, just test this class, but don't be, uh, yeah, what's the English word? Meer uh, 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 you should uh, You should test everything because, well, uh, it just uh, adds a lot of time, and an Azure function a run method is static anyways, so which is quite hard to test, at least if you're having some dependencies. So uh, just uh, that's what I wanted to tell about this. Uh, but uh, other than that, uh, just uh, we have some uh, existing patterns uh, uh, developed in the past couple of years, uh, you probably heard of the solid uh, principles, uh, single responsibility, as I mentioned, a function should do only one thing. Interface segregation, awesome, of course, just work with contracts and not with implementations. Dependency inversion, also awesome. Uh, you can use this for testing, of course. Uh, and I hear some people uh, here uh, thinking, well, he mentioned Autofuck, which is an IOC container uh, framework, of course. Uh, awesome. I'm not using it with Azure Functions because why use an IOC container framework when the only dependencies you have are maybe one or two business logic classes which do something. I don't need an IOC framework to have uh, match an interface with a concrete uh, class and only have one implementation per interface, which is silly, uh, just to register this and your Azure function will probably only have, in total, 30, 50 lines of code. And of course, creating a container adds up to the ramp up time, because every time your Azure function is instantiated, it has to create this IOC container, which takes up milliseconds, in uh, best case. So uh, I'm not using a uh, an IOC container. I do, do use dependency injection, uh, what uh, I've done is uh, do something like this. Uh, having a normal default constructor, which I'm using all uh, throughout my code, and having an overload, 
which I'm able to do some injection. And the only time this overload is used is whenever I'm creating a test. You might say, well, I have multiple implementations of my iCosmos client, which is possible, of course. But, hmm? well, uh, for example, I have a, let's say, I have a Cosmos client which connects to the Cassandra implementation and to the Mongo implementation. For, uh, for the argument's sake. Uh, well, if you have such a scenario, do you actually need both implementations inside one Azure function? Probably not. And if so, isn't it easier just to split it up in multiple functions and having the splitting down, uh, the, the triggering uh, being handled by your topic? Probably so. So that's why I don't use IOC containers, because there's only one implementation inside all of my Azure functions per interface. So now for the actual creation of the solution. Uh, this is the solution I want to create. A get uh, Azure function, a post Azure function communicating with a queue, uh, and a trigger Azure function which is communicating or being triggered by a queue and storing stuff in the Cosmos DB. And of course, the get Azure function, the HTTP triggered Azure function, will read directly from Cosmos DB because I neglected to create an Azure cache binding. So that's about it. Uh, let's dive into Visual Studio. Let's see if I can duplicate the screens. Awesome. So let's start with uh, a completely empty Visual Studio. When yes. Uh, whenever you want to create an, uh, a function app, uh, just make sure you install the latest Azure Function tooling. Uh, so you'll get this uh, nice Azure Function template. Uh, that's all there is to it. This will create a new function app solution for you. Uh, oh yeah, because it's, uh, it's a new template help. Uh, you can choose, do you want an HTTP trigger, a queue trigger, or a timer trigger. Those are the default. You can also choose uh, in the latest version if you want a V1 or a V2. V1 is just .NET Core, uh, .NET Framework, V2, .NET Core which is still in preview, and it's quite a bit slower uh, today, maybe not tomorrow, uh, but today it's quite a bit slower, so just choose V1 if you want to use this stuff in production. And we want to have an HTTP trigger. Uh, I'm using the storage emu emulator, which uh, makes sure some data is being persisted inside uh, the, inside the bl uh, blobs. Uh, Azure functions do need blobs because your code has to be stored somewhere. Access rights, anonymous in our case. Uh, you can change this any time you like. This would all be JSON, generating JSON? Uh, this is creating C sharp files because I'm using Visual Studio. This will create C sharp files. Correct. Correct, this will be uh, built into JSON files. Uh, let's just uh, wait for the project to be created. You might have noticed I've mentioned function app. Uh, this, is, this will get deployed as one big function app. And a function app can contain multiple Azure functions. You should uh, see a function app as one, p which contains one piece of domain logic as it say. So uh, in my case, I, uh, I have a function app with does URL minification or a U has a URL minification solution. So in this function app, I'll just create the get, the post, the, tri the queue triggered function. And of course, later I'll create the Redis cache custom binding and uh, trigger, uh, triggered uh, functions for this. Uh, but as you see, let's just do some nice indenting. As you see, I have an HTTP trigger with anonymous, uh, get and a post, and the route is null uh, by default. Uh, this is what the wizard has done. It has uh, created a function name function1, 
and whenever I will I'll run this, uh, I have a function one which can be called by localhost 7071 slash API slash function one. And I'll trigger this code. Now when I build this, radio rebuild okay I'll just turn on all hidden files debug uh, you'll see there's a folder uh, called function one which reflects the name of uh, my function and this function one has a function.json file uh, inside it which contains all of the binding information necessary to run my Azure function, also the script file and the entry point. So if you decide I don't want to have my Azure function starting point, uh, don't want to run but want uh, start, you should just change this also to start. Oh. And then you're done and whenever you build this will get changed. Oh, automatically. I didn't have to change it over here, of course, because it's generated. Uh, and all of this data is uh, being created by the Azure Function Runtime because I've set the attribute over here. And that's tr triggering uh, and that's triggering an HTTP. So I've created a demo, of course. Oh, uh, maybe good to mention. There's also a local settings uh, file, uh, which contains, which will contain all of your secret information, like the app.config or the web.config. So uh, your connection strings, your secrets, your well, other stuff like this uh, will be uh, added uh, to this file, or you should add it. This is for local testing, of course. Yes, yes. Uh, whenever you deploy this. Please use Visual Studio Team Services for this, of course, for the uh, for the adding uh, application settings to your Azure function. Uh, but you can change this in a portal, of course, just under the application settings uh, link, I guess. Yes, this is for local testing, and it's called local settings now. Uh, I guess I think it was 15 months ago. It was called upsettings.json so there are some changes but i think this is quite stable uh, now it has been the uh, it has been called local settings.json for well a year now so i've created a demo uh, solution of course um, this is my demo um, for the sake of time let's just go to step three which is the complete solution i have And as you can see, pr probably can see, is I have uh, created a get uh, Azure function, a create Azure function, and a process Azure, Azure function. Oh. oh, doesn't work. And a process, um, just to handle all of the, just to handle the three uh, HTTP triggers or the three Azure functions, the functionality I want to uh, have. So the get, the post, and the process. So the get looks like uh, this, an HTTP trigger, much like this, uh, the one we uh, used uh, before, or we saw below before. As I mentioned, I have a slug. Uh, this is the route, uh, so it will be slash API slash my minify URL. Uh, I want uh, this slug to uh, be added as a, as a string to my code. You could also uh, have a, a complex object, complex object over here. Uh, if you have multiple properties which you want to uh, uh, which you want to well, combine inside one complex object, uh, which is strange in a get scenario because you have a query string and doing complex objects inside a query string could be hard. So just don't see okay um, and as I mentioned uh, my get method wants to read data from Cosmos DB and in my first attempts 
I created my own I Cosmos DB client and a Cosmos DB client, which uh, did some reading inside Cosmos DB. But a couple of weeks ago, I discovered the document DB attribute and the SQL query uh, uh, parameter it has. So you can just do a select star from, well, my database uh, where the minified uh, slug is slug. So whenever you run or trigger this uh, function, uh, the minified URL uh, enumeration will contain all records inside Cosmos DB which match this criteria, which is awesome, of course, because now I can just delete the Cosmos DB client. I have proof over here. It's still this is this is my production uh, system. So I have the Cosmos client, and in the get I'm still. Well, I have a handler which does, of course, the dependency injection of the Cosmos DB client. Terrible, terrible. But uh, because of the Azure Function team, I can just make it simpler. So entering the, the function, uh, if there are, aren't are any uh, minified URLs, well, not found. If there are, uh, get minified URL, what does this do? Oh, it takes the last. I have some error in persisting my data. So anytime I want to overwrite my uh, minified URL, um, I'm creating a new record inside Cosmos. So I have to uh, change this uh, later on. So, but uh, for now, I'm just taking the last and create a warning. So I know I still have to fix this. Uh, not very exciting. And when I'm done, I'm just uh, uh, returning uh, an HTTP uh, response with a redirect, of course. So the, uh, this is uh, so the, my, my code isn't very uh, well interesting. Uh, what's most interesting is the HTTP trigger and the cost document DB binding, which make all the magic happen. Uh, of course, you have to specify which. Uh, database and which uh, partition you want to use and the connection string but that's all very straightforward all of the stuff is uh, added inside the, the local settings JSON over here uh, of course we have the create and if you remember the create Azure function also is an HTTP trigger which uh, writes back to uh, the service bus so let's fix the indenting over here uh, we still have the anonymous with the post and the route create and I'm posting uh, a message to this uh, re request uh, I'm posting a request to this and whenever uh, there's a request I deserialize it to an object I want validate uh, the data if it's uh, valid if not well respond to bad request and if it is if it is uh, valid uh, what I'm doing here oh adding some data uh, like the, like I mentioned, the created date. So not very exciting. Uh, you could just skip this if you want to, and create a response. My minified URL will be created with well this endpoint. And if I'm lucky, if I've specified this correctly with the correct connection string and the correct, uh, I guess this is the subscription. The, the topic I want to, the topic name, yes, and the connection name, <coughs> and uh, it will be written uh, to the to the service bus topic. Uh, fairly straightforward. I didn't have to do anything for this myself. Just create some validation logic, uh, and that's the creation. Uh, in order to invoke this, just man. I'm just using Postman because I don't need a UI for this. There it is. Not. <coughs> Move. There it is. So create a minified link. I'm uh, posting uh, to the uh, create endpoint. This is the JSON I'm sending, so the minified slug dotnet meetup amsterdam the full url dotnet amsterdam uh, and whenever i send this to my azure function it should persist it or it should 
create a new record on the service bus. And whenever a new record is added to the service bus, I have this process Azure function, which has a service bus trigger. As you can see, this is a service bus trigger. And this is a service bus binding. This is stuff you have to know when you're using Azure functions. I haven't uh, thought of this. Uh, I haven't made this up myself. And the documentation is quite clear. Uh, so service bus trigger, uh, the queue topic name, the subscription. Yes, uh, you need to manage access rights. I don't know why, because I thought listen would be good enough. But having a listen connection uh, doesn't work, so please use the manage. And of course, the connection string to your service bus. Uh, you'll get the minified URL. I know it's a minified URL object. If it's not, you'll get an exception thrown in your logging. Uh, so I'm, I know it's a minified URL because I have uh, bound it over here. And over here, you can see I'm using a binder instead of using the Cosmos DB binding again, like I did in the in the get. Over here, you can see I've used the document DB binding in order to uh, add data to Cosmos. I'm not doing this in the process because I want, I don't want to specify secrets inside my local settings or inside my application settings. I want to specify secrets in Keyfold because it's meant to hold set, uh, meant to hold secrets. You can do this, but only for bindings. Uh, it doesn't work for triggers, so that's. There's still an issue uh, on the GitHub open, which uh, where people are asking, well, please uh, add this binding, uh, add this key fold support also for uh, triggers. So I don't have to specify this connection string anymore over here. But at the moment, it's still uh, under review or at least not implemented. So when using the uh, output binding, I have created a small helper method to do this. Uh, over here, I'm creating an iAsync collector uh, with a minified URL. So if you want to add data to Cosmos DB, or I think it's also for other repositories you want to write to, like, well, let's say a blob storage also is a repository. Uh, you also need uh, the async collectors, or the yeah, async collectors. So what you do over here is having a binder. Uh, the binder needs to uh, you need to add a document db attribute to this uh, which is actually the same as the one over here uh, it's just uh, so what you're doing over here in the get uh, function is actually exactly the same as doing over here uh, only just I'm using Azure key fold uh, data for uh, binding my data over here so I've created a helper uh, class secret, which does the actual key fold uh, retrieval of settings. If you, if you think of uh, using key fold in your own production system, uh, please make sure this key fold client is created as a singleton or something which looks like a singleton, uh, because the key fold client and any other client to some other system is uh, quite expensive to create. <coughs> and if it is threat, threat safe, uh, you should share it across your instances. Because even though a serverless doesn't, or Azure Functions uh, is, is serverless, doesn't mean every invocation of your Azure Function is hosted on a different server. A lot of the times, your Azure Function invocation, your Azure Function instances are being reused, uh, and if not, it's probably deployed on the same server, or it might be deployed on the same server. And if you have this uh, key fault client or any other client uh, set up as a singleton, you don't waste CPU cycles to create uh, all of this stuff again. So that's just a heads up. So that's the processing. And as you can see, I'm not doing anything interesting over here. I'm creating the binding. I could also have used the same binding as uh, in the get method. Uh, but I've used something more fancy over here. Uh, creating the new minified URL, which is just doing some 
mapping to a new object. Not very interesting, but uh, well necessary, or at least I wanted to do this, and adding it to my output binding, which I've created over here. That's about it for creating uh, an Azure function solution. So uh, the most important thing you have to remember is just use bindings and triggers and don't do stuff like this yourself because bindings and triggers are quite powerful. Any questions on uh, this Visual Studio stuff? No? Good because I'm already over time. So I'll, uh, I had some slides uh, covering uh, deployment. Uh, I'll skip this. There's an easy mode in the Azure portal. You can just uh, click deployment options, uh, set this up like uh, any other Azure app service connected to GitHub and deploy it. Uh, not recommended for actual solutions. For actual solutions, you should use Visual Studio Team Services or some other uh, build and uh, CI CD server. Uh, use uh, an ASP.NET Core template, which has all the steps set up correctly. Uh, create a release pipeline. Deploy it to a slot or not. Uh, direct to, to production is good enough. Uh, do remember to point to the correct zip package if you connect if you point this to the folder like it is default, it will just deploy the complete folder to your Azure function, which is, well, not very useful because now you have a lot of files over there which don't do anything. Uh, and if you're lucky, you'll see some uh, green checkboxes. Uh, in the portal, you can see uh, you have deployed this uh, with CI/CD because it's uh, read-only mode. And uh, bonus proxies. Uh, very quickly, uh, my URL minification uh, serves uh, looks like this, API slash minified URL, which is terrible, of course, because who wants API when the URL is minified? You want to have something like this. And this also is terrible because you have the my prefix, which is, well, silly. And that's because A records aren't supported with Azure Functions yet, which makes sense, of course, because A records point to an IP address and being serverless, you don't actually have, well, an IP address. Uh, they're fixing this. They're busy fixing this. Uh, so you can point A records or something like it. Uh, I can only imagine the trouble they're going through to support this, but uh, it's coming, uh, but uh, not working uh, at this moment. So how to create, a, how to remove the API prefix? Well, just add the proxy. A proxy is, again, JSON. Uh, there's no tooling for this yet, so you have to write your own JSON, which looks a bit like this. So I have created the, the get minified redirect. That's the name of the proxy. Uh, what should it match? Well, it should match a get request with a, a route slug. So an, whenever I'm calling my.jdfa.li slash awesome, it should redirect to my.jdfa.li slash API slash awesome. You can point this to any other external URL or any other Azure function if you want, but that's proxies. It's awesome. It, I think, is uh, generally available nowadays. It wasn't when I used this, but it's working for over eight months now. Oh, awesome. If you have any questions later on, uh, feel free to contact me. Uh, the complete production code can be found on GitHub. I can be found on Twitter. You uh, can email me or uh, just follow my blogs, which uh, contain some more information on Azure Functions and other awesome stuff uh, found on Azure. Thank you all. <laughs>